it's a uh, uh, chemical of about 300 microcalvin. So it's not ultra cold, but uh, it's cold enough you can neglect any uh, Doppler effect in our systems. Because all of our experiment was carried out in rubidium atom, so uh, so this uh, uh, rubidium atom, so this one is our uh, the mass of our, our group. As you can see, uh, due to the laser traffic cooling, uh, it feels very cold and chilly. And there's uh, three pieces of hair on top of its head. Uh, this is because the trapping laser, uh, exact state of the trapping laser has content of that fine into three. So, so uh, this is, uh, my scar is drawn by my, my uh, former students. So uh, in EIT, there are two very important uh, parameters. One is the coherence time. Uh, the coherence time in our system is about 100 microseconds, <laughs> and the second one is the upper density, which is larger than 200. So OD is defined by following the output intensity is equal to input intensity multiplied by x1 minus OD. So x1 minus 200 is a very small number. Okay. So OD also uh, indicates the interaction strength between the line and the, the atoms. So this is our experiment setup. So my student called it up to jungles. So there are eight dial lasers, one laser amplifier, and one UHB uh, system. So uh, and more than 300 uh, optical components. So uh, we try to make our system as simple as possible. So the price we pay is we have very complicated experiment setup. So uh, the file of, of this optical table is our vacuum chamber. So our vacuum chamber is made of a glass cell. It's MIT made in Taiwan. Okay, it's it's a uh, made up by a glass pro, uh, grow, uh, glass blower in the neighbor university, Zhang University, and the dimension is about four by four by eight, eight centimeter cube. So the uh, vacuum inside is about ten to minus nine core, which is typical uh, uh, vacuum condition for laser traffic cooling experiment. So we have uh, three pairs of counter propagating, propagating traffic uh, light from top down and left right and back, back, uh, back one forward direction. And we have a two uh, rectangular <coughs> uh, coil to produce this uh, uh, upper trap to produce this cigar shape coherent clouds. So the dimension of this coherent cloud is about nine by two by two uh, millimeter cube. So uh, the carbon field and profile for the EIT uh, study will propagate along the uh, major axis of this uh, cigar shape coherent cloud. Uh, in this way, we can enhance the upper density of, of, of between the light and the meters. And we have a three pair of the compensation coil to just minimize the straight field on environment. So this is a typical EID spectrum. Uh, because EID is a, a phenomenon in three-level system, so in the spectroscopy measurement, the coupling field frequency is fixed to the resonance, and we swap the pro uh, frequency across the transition. So here is the pro transition plotted against the pro detuning. Uh, in the units of a natural light width, which is 6 megahertz in our case. As you can see around resonance, the transmission is almost zero because at that time, the upper density is about 7, so the transmission is about 0.1%. Uh, right on the resonance, the transmission is nearly 100%. And so this is clearly demonstrated, we have, we, we observe this EIT effect. And the transparency window is only about a few hundred uh, kilohertz, which is very narrow and much narrower than the the nature line weeks. So uh, this data is taken uh, much uh, more recently. Uh, it up to this about 228. As you can see, even uh, the laser is detuned five nature line weeks away. The transmission is only about 10 percent. And near the resonance, we, we can still see this 100 percent transparency. We can enlarge this part of the spectrum uh, in here. Uh, <coughs> the line weeks is about 200. 50 kilohertz, and the right on resonance, you have 100% transparency. And a little bit away from the, uh, the resonance frequency, then the transparency decay to 10 to minus 99, because uh, this exponent minus 228 uh, is about 10 to minus 99. So you already observe very narrow and high contrast also in profile. This indicate we have a very large chromatic dispersion in our system, and we can make the light pulse propagate very slowly in our atoms. So here are the uh, data uh, showing the solar light and storage of light. So we plot the pro transmission as a function of uh, time. So in the top plot, 
The flake line is input propulse, and the red line is output propulse on the constant presence of the coupling field. So as you can see, there is about 3.5 microsecond delay time. And the median length is only about one, one centimeter. So, so the light speed is only about three kilo, kilometer per second, which is reduced by uh, five of the magnitude as, uh, as compared to the speed in the vacuum. So as this time in instant, all the input ports had already entered the patents, and none of the output ports coming out of it. So we quickly switch off the coupling field. So about four microsecond, the detector received no signal at all. The reason is we store these light ports in the heated patterns. After this four microseconds, then we turn the coupling field back up, and the stored uh, ports is uh, coming out of come, comes out of the patterns. As you can see, uh, there is no attenuation at all because our coherence time is about uh, 100 microseconds. So 400 microseconds. Uh, story time does not uh, de uh, deteriorate energy at all. So what to happen during the storage? Uh, this uh, switching process, uh, this writing process, we turning off the coupling field, just in two, induce a two photon Raman transition. The population will absorb pro photon and emit a coupling photon. So after the coupling field can be turned off, and the atomic wave function remain in our system. So we can call it the ground state coherence or Raman coherence or spin excitation. So this uh, re reading process is just reverse the two photon Raman transition. Population will absorb coupling field and emit and the uh, pro photon and propagate out of the system. So this EIT storage uh, is a, a coherent process and can provide a method for the exchange wave function between the photon and the atoms. So it can be used as a quantum memory. So for memory, there are three very important fields of memory. Uh, storage efficiency, which is defined by by ratio of output energy to input energy. And the delay uh, bandwidth product, which is, which is defined by storage time divided by uh, post width. And also the fidelity, which is the input output wave function product square, normalized by the amplitudes. So with a uh, very large upper density and uh, low coherence time. Also this uh, forward right in and backward uh, retrieving process, we can enhance this storage efficiency to 75, 78%. So previously, uh, before this work, the uh, uh, EIT storage efficiency is only about 50%, which means that this method is not very useful. But uh, in our uh, experiment, we, we, we demonstrate we can enhance this uh, storage efficiency to 78%. And in more recent experiment, we can even improve to 95%. And we are going to submit a manuscript about it, this result. Also, we can measure this uh, storage efficiency as a function of storage time. So at the 50% storage efficiency, then we can get a, a we can we can get delay bandwidth product about 74. So both about about the whole record uh, right now. So all, also we use this uh, inter binary interferometer to directly measure the phase evolution of the reference pulse the right in pulse and read out pulse, we can see that they maintain very good physical gears. And from that, we can demonstrate how fidelity is larger than 0.9. The reason it's less than perfect is due to the noise in our uh, binary signal here. So this work just demonstrates that uh, EIT storage can be used as a quantum memory in the future. So, uh, so with the idea that store coherence is equivalent to the pro pulse, so we proposed and also experiment demonstrate the following photon uh, photon interaction scheme. The, uh, the, the process is following. So, first, we store the propulse into the medium. So, during the, so this propulse is converted to this ground state coherence. So, during the storage time, we'll apply another uh, signal pulse. Uh, and this is far D2. So, this signal pulse will induce an AC stack shift on the ground state. It's changed the precession frequency of your ground state coherence. So the phase of your ground state coherence is also changed. And during the uh, readout process, we convert this uh, ground state coherence back to the propulse. So the phase of the propulse is also changed. So we can use uh, the signal pulse to phase modulate the propulse. So this is cost phase modulation scheme. And also, similarly, we can use the signal pulse to switch the propulse. You just apply a resonant uh, signal pulse during the storage time to destroy your ground state coherence. So when we convert the ground state coherence back to the propulse, uh, 
So its energy is severely attenuated. So you can use a, a light bulb to switch another light bulb. Okay. So this uh, uh, efficiency of a cold space modulation is very similar to this uh, uh, switching efficiency. So, and if you can achieve single photon cold space modulation, uh, have a and uh, have a phase shift uh, of uh, 180 degree, then you can use you can use it uh, in, in the in the in the application of quantum phase scale and quantum time differential measurement also also produce this uh, some uh, entangled photon pair. So at that time we can achieve a phase shift about 44 degree. So at uh, 18 photon per atomic uh, absorbing cross section. So it still have uh, some distance away to single photon post phase modulation. So how can we further improve? So we also make this signal pulse stop in our media. So in principle, then these two light pulse can interact with the interaction time as long as possible. So even with very low light level, you can still achieve significant uh, this uh, Darwinian efficiency. That's the basic idea. So here we just show uh, this uh, by using this all up switching by using one light pulse switch another one to demonstrate such idea. So this uh, switching efficiency is defined by this formula. Psi is called the uh, Darwinian efficiency, and n divided by n multiplied by sigma is just a uh, uh, number of photons per atomic cross-section. For example. If this efficiency is equal to one, if we have one photon focus to uh, 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 atomic absorbing causation, then you will get an attenuation factor about exponential minus one. So psi equals to two, so you can get uh, like exponential minus two, which is about 10 percent, 10 dB. So in the left plot, we we uh, we measure this uh, uh, psi as a function of upper density. As I mentioned before, this upper density is just indicate the intention strength between the light and the atoms. So uh, as the whole increase, initially you can see this uh, efficiency also increase, but eventually saturates at a value of about 0.45. Okay. Uh, but we, if we can start to light pulse, then this side can be linearly increased with the uh, OD. And at the, at the larger OD at that time, we can achieve uh, about linear efficiency about uh, one point. 1.8, which is about four, four, four improvement than the two moving light forces. And the most yeah. this sigma sigma is uh, 0 0.1 percent. This uh, sigma three, is the overlap overlap between the uh, photon and the atom. Yeah. yeah, and the atom. So yeah, it's on the order of less than a percent. No? This sigma, yeah. this sigma is, is area, right? Like uh, it's like a lambda square, the whole yeah. lambda square. So it is the, the how much there is overlap between the wave function of the photon. And the wave function of the atom. Okay, that's right. That's right. It's like just like collect co collection cross section between the two. Okay. Yeah. So most importantly, <coughs> this uh, with our method, this uh, Darwinian efficiency can increase uh, with OD and without any upper <coughs> level. So I, I think uh, uh, this is the first experiment demonstration we can make two light uh, two light pulse star in the atom and make them interaction with each other. So this nature physics uh, with the article uh, from the light switch uh, nicely summarizes our work. So it says stopping light pulse and making them detect in the media is a way to get more or less. Okay, I think, yeah, it's quite <coughs> nice describe uh, the result of work. So, um, so for for this this title, uh, you you now can understand it's not the light switch uh, which is frozen or out of order. It's a switch made of frozen light. In our case, so I make a quick summary about the, our previous work. So uh, first, I want to uh, acknowledge my long-term collaborator, uh, Dr. In Chen Chen and Dr. Yong Fan Chen, uh, who are my former uh, PhD student, uh, are now a re uh, associate research fellow in Institute of Atomic and Molecular Sciences at the Kennedy Seneca, and Yong Fan is a professor in Department of Physics at you know, the Chengdu University. So as you can see, this uh, EIT slow light effect can enhance this nonlinear efficiency, can achieve very high nonlinear efficiency even at the single photon level. Also, this EIT based storage can be used as a quantum memory. However, all the previous study or deal with this single component slow light, which is not really qubit. So now how we can create this spinner slow light or, or two component qubit? We are using this double tripod scheme. So this double tripod scheme consists of uh, three uh, ground state and two excited state, and driven by four carbon field 
omega A1, omega A2, omega B1, and omega B2. And the two pro field, uh, epsilon A and epsilon B. Okay, uh, for simplicity, we can make the Rabi frequency of this four coupling field have the same amplitude. But we just know it as, uh, as omega. And, and also, they are rarely phase to pi. So this double tripod scheme can equivalent to two coupled EIT scheme. And the coupling is through the, the detuning in the system. So why we call it double tripod? Because for all the rate transition, you have a three ground state. One excited state, just like one tripod. And the, all the blue transition, you have a three ground state and one excited state, just like second tripod. So these two tripods share the same ground state coherence. And at, under this condition, so it just put in two, two EIT and couple with this uh, detuning here. And the relation between the output uh, pro and the input pro is given by this formula, uh, where this uh, oscillation phase phi is proportional to the detuning. So you can increase the detuning to, to increase phi. Okay. And in our, uh, in our actual experiment, uh, this rate, rate transition uh, are the Rubidian D1 transition, which has a wavelength of 795 uh, nanometer. And all the blue transition are the Rubidian D2 transition, which has wavelengths of uh, 780 nanometer. So, and we put all the population to single D minus state to form this uh, nearly idea five level uh, double trade masking. So, uh, in the experiment, we're only sending Pro A into the system. So, for, for, for input, we just write down one zero vector of run zero. So, uh, so then we can operate, uh, we can just do the mathematics. We can find out uh, the output pro A and the pro B uh, is proportional to cosine square phi, the sine square phi. Again, this phi is proportional to the tuning here. So we measure the energy transmission of pro A and the pro B as a function of the tuning. So we see this very nice oscillation uh, behavior. So these dots are the experimental data and solid lines are the uh, 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 theoretical prediction here. Uh, so, uh, of course, you can see as you increase the tuning, uh, the energy uh, is attenuated. This is due to this prefactor uh, in here. Uh, because uh, in order to, to induce uh, oscillation phase five, we need a detuning. And this detuning makes your EIT transparency is less than perfect. So you can cause some attenuation here. So um, if we look at this formula again, this phi is proportional to the tuning, and this proportionality uh, is just the propagation delay, delay time of slow line. So in our previous experiment, we, we always can replace this slow line effect by slow line effect by just changing this uh, propagation time to the storage time. So we are wondering, if we store this spinner solar into our atoms, can we get the same oscillation here? And the answer, the, the answer is yes. Okay. So we store for about 50 microseconds, and we change the detuning and the read out energy of pro and pro B. You can see have, have very nice oscillation behavior here. And there's no decay at all. In the previous slides, there's only about uh, two cycles for the detuning uh, of about 1.2 megahertz span. But here, oops, here, uh, for, the, for about 100, 120 kilohertz uh, detuning span, you can have a uh, one, two, one, two, three, almost like three and a half uh, oscillation. That is that's because uh, the storage time is about uh, 10 times longer the propagation delay time in our case. So, of course, we can replace this oscillation phi uh, by this formula, which is uh, uh, storage time multiplied by detuning. And the input output relation, if you only send in pro A, the input output relation can just give me by cosine square of phi and the sine square of phi. So, so, this kind of data just smells like an interferometer. So, we can do some interferometer experiment. Uh, let me make an analogy of this uh, double tripod scheme and uh, this box uh, center in front. Okay, so first we send the probe into double tripod scheme. We just send it in a, a, 
a laser beam to this uh, interferometer. So when we store the light pulse, it creates two coherence in our system. It just the storage just storing process just like being speaker. It split this light beam into two optical passes. Okay, and you have detuning that change the uh, precision frequency of these, these two uh, ground state coherence. They can have different phases, just like you have two different pass lengths. Okay, they can induce some phase shift. So if these two two pass lengths have uh, uh, are in phase, then you can have construct interference. Uh, this, I'm sorry, out of phase, you have distorted interference. So you send the light beam in the horizontal direction, then the light beam will come out in the vertical direction of your interferometer. For the double tri bar scheme, you send in pro A, you can get a pro B here. Because your phase 5 is equal to uh, 180 degree or pi. Also, you can have a construct interference. You send in light beam horizontally, get light beam out horizontally. You can send in pro A, you get a pro B. Also, you can have some phase somewhere between the uh, complete inter uh, construct interference or complete destructive interference. So we can get both that be coming out. So in spinner solar case, you can get both point and probe coming out. So, so we just fix this detuning and we vary these different uh, uh, story time and do two measurements. So in the first measurement, we set this detuning to 10 kilohertz. So we can see this nice or station can decay uh, signal here. The reason is decay because the storage time of our system is about 100 microsecond. So that is due to the finite coherence time in our system. So in the second uh, measurement, we set the tuning equal to 20 kilohertz. So you, you can see because the detuning is larger, so the frequency is higher. The different frequency of different difference is larger. So you can see this, uh, you can see more regular oscillation. And we feed this data to determine these two uh, frequent difference. Uh, it's given us about 9.7 kilohertz here. So for storage time about 100 microseconds, we can get a precision about 100 hertz here. So the current record of the storage time is about one minute, but not in my group. Okay. Uh, so in, in a group in university, uh, tech, uh, in the technical university of Darmstadt, so they can do the storage for about one minute. So this can push this precision to one millihertz here. So we can use this spinner solar as an interferometer to detect any two photon detuning, uh, which is induced by magnetic field or by some very weak uh, laser power. So you can use this way to do some precision measurement here. Okay, if we can send a single photon to the double driver system, and the, the single photon coming out can be the superposition of these two wavelengths. Uh, omega A and Omega B, which is 780 nanometer and 7, uh, 95 nanometer in all cases. And this uh, probability amplitude alpha beta is just determined by this uh, oscillation phases, okay? Uh, which is proportional to detuning uh, multiplied by this uh, storage time here. So in the long distance uh, quantum communication, if we can use this kind of two color qubit, and it can inert to the bi-refrigerant material, uh, which co can cause uh, the, the deterioration of the fidelity of your, your qubit. For example, like optical fiber is a bi refringent material. So if you can use this two color qubit in long distance quantum communication, such problem can be minimized. So we already see in the previous slide, we can see this uh, very nice uh, oscillation uh, signal. It's just like a rubber oscillation for this uh, two color qubit. So uh, this double tri bar scene can also work as a quantum memory for this two color qubit. If we just set the tuning to equal to zero, so this, this double tri bar scheme can become two EID scheme uh, without couple to each other. So you, you send in some sort of position state of a pro and pro B, so they just store separately. And you can get these two coming out. So to demonstrate, demonstrate that, we send in different combination of alpha to beta, like uh, the ratio square equal to 0.5, one and a two, and we store for three microseconds. Also, we store for 33 microseconds. So as you can see, after 13 microseconds extra storage time, the ratio still keep the same, and the pole shape also still keep the same. Or all it, there's a little bit delay, uh, decay in the energy that's caused by the finite storage time in our system. But the, uh, eventually, these similarity are very, very, very similar. So this demonstrate uh, we can use this uh, double tri scheme 
as a quantum memory for these two color qubits. So memory is very important in this room, this quantum communication. So also we can use this double tripod thing as a quantum rotator. For example, uh, during the story time, we can induce some detuning. So this detuning uh, can, can just, uh, for example, like uh, around the 20 kilohertz, we can send it in alpha beta equal to one zero and get the alpha beta equal to zero one. So you can just complete uh, flip with your spin. Also, you can use some kind of a arbitrary oscillation phase five uh, determined by this tuning here to get some kind of uh, slow producing state of your your uh, omega a and omega b two modes. And this tuning can can be used by magnetic field or or some uh, light field with some Lyman shift or H star shift. So I make conclusion and we report the first experimental demonstration of spin and slow light and the uh, slow spin and slow light can behave like an interferometer for precision frequency determination. And single photon spin and light can be considered as a two-color qubit. We also demonstrate this double type of spin can be used as quantum memory and rotator. So more detail can be found in this paper. And also there are some theoretical uh, idea about how to use this uh, spin and slow light in the uh, study of a Dirac particle. It's very well met our client common can find out these two ideas in these two papers here. So finally, I will make uh, an argument about our founding agents, and also my student, the postdoc, Meng uh, Rong, Gao Fan, Xing Yuan, and Hong Wen, and also my theoretical collaborator, Peter uh, Minas, uh, of Vilnius University, Spain. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Uh, in uh, 2002, 2003, with my uh, postdoc David Petrosian, we published a series of papers on cross phase modulation as a means of entangling two photons. Entangling two photons, okay? Yes. Uh, um, so, uh, one conclusion we had was that, uh, and we, we, we followed the, the same mechanism, except that. Uh, we did not find a particular advantage to the double tripod uh, scheme, but perhaps there is some. Uh, what we did find out is that co-propagating pulses have a disadvantage because the nonlinear shift at the peak is different from the nonlinear shift at the tail, and, and therefore, what we suggested uh, in one of the papers is to have one uh, pulse actually uh, be trapped so it uh, stays uh, stationary, whereas the other sloshes back and forth through it and th thereby averages out the non-uniformity of the shift. However, even with that, and that of course uh, did uh, uh, cause some improvement. However, even with this provision, our conclusion was that the only viable way of fully entangling two photons by cross phase modulation is to use the dipole dipole interaction. Uh, and uh, this is a paper with the uh, uh, Fridler, which actually was experimentally expl uh, uh, implemented by Lukin's group yeah. uh, uh, recently. So, could you comment on that? Yeah, okay. Actually, you just make a very good suggestion and comments on my work here, okay? Yes. And actually, yes, actually, uh, right now we are going to do this EIT readable experiment yes. in my lab. I hope you have time to visit my experiment, okay? But I don't know how, what's the schedule here. So eventually, again, as, as, as you, you just mentioned, we try to use this type of type, strong type of type of impaction to facilitate this uh, photo photo interaction here. All the trick we already play uh, with these two stop light poles here. We can also play the same trick in this uh, regular EID scheme. Yes, but uh, yeah. the, the point was that if you don't use the dipole dipole interactions, you do not get a full pi phase shift of one caused by the other at the single photon level. I understand, that, because there's a lot of uh, uh, theoretical paper on that argument, like, for example, Well, I Oscar. suggest that ours were the first. Okay, yeah, <laughs> we can have more discussion. Okay. okay. Yes. Any more questions? So, 
So, okay, uh, so let's thank our speaker. Uh, let's talk in the morning to uh, uh, Professor Yao Tung Shi. opportunity to be here and thanks for the chair and my name is uh, Yu Chun Hoi and I come from Department of Physics uh, National Tsinghua University. Uh, the title of my talk is Quantum Optics with Propagating Microwaves in Superconducting Circuits and uh, we use uh, superconducting circuits to make artificial atoms and uh, study uh, this artificial atom to study a uh, quantum optic phenomenon in one dimensional space. And in particular, in this talk, I will show you a series of uh, quantum optical uh, uh, phenomena, including resonance, scattering, and uh, photon number filter. And at the end, I will show you how we can modify the, uh, the spontaneous emission rate of uh, an artificial atom. 
Uh, so uh, this is the natural atom, and on the right hand side is uh, uh, the artificial atom that we made on chip. And we study quantum optics on chip, and shine microwave photon interact with the atom and see how it scatter. And the advantage of using this kind of uh, uh, artificial atom is as follows. Uh, we can engineer atom-like interaction on chip, and also, uh, so this is a, a standard fabrication technique, and the transition energy of the atom can be killed, and is very mechanical stable. Uh, so compared to quantum optics uh, uh, toolbox, uh, uh, this slide shows you uh, superconducting circuit uh, quantum optics toolbox. So for quantum optics, we use fiber optics compared to superconducting circuits. We use super, uh, transmission line and the beam, uh, the beam speaker, we use hybrid coupler. The mirror correspond to uh, boundary condition in, uh, uh, in circuits, which is uh, a capacitance or, or grounded. And then uh, laser light, uh, out, output a coherent light, which corresponds to a microwave coherent source, and uh, 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 the counter uh, photon photon counter correspond to uh, in microwave domain. We don't have a um, perfect microwave count uh, counter, and instead we amplify the weaker uh, uh, quantum microwave signal and and uh, use a actual time detection to measure uh, the uh, the properties of the. Uh, microwaves and on the left hand side we play with optical photons and on the right hand side we play with uh, microwave photons and uh, uh, you may ask uh, how we uh, build an artificial atom based on uh, superconducting circuits actually it's just based on these three basic elements the first one is linear capacitance and then linear inductance and nonlinear inductance this kind of nonlinear inductance is come from a so-called a Joseon junction, which is a superconductor insulator superconductor junction, and this tunnel junction. This is very thin layer of insulator, and this uh, Joseon junction is de determined by these two uh, equation: current phase uh, equation and phase voltage equation. And from these two equation, you you will know that. Uh, this such kind of Joseph junction is a uh, nonlinear uh, inductance. And to build, uh, this slide shows you how we build a uh, uh, super, uh, artificial atom based on quantized uh, superconducting circuits. Uh, imagine if we have a, a very simple LC oscillator and the resonance frequency is just the inverse square root of LC uh, and then uh, if we cool it down at very low temperature, then you see the quantize of the energy level where all the transition energy is omega zero. And now if we replace the uh, linear inductance with a nonlinear inductance, so-called Joseon junction, then the energy spectrum becomes enharmonic uh, where the spacing are not equal, uh, so-called enharmonic. And therefore, we can adjust the lowest uh, uh, ground state and excited state, and we cool it down at mini Kelvin stage, where the uh, resonant, where the h bar omega is much greater than the thermal energy. Then we can initialize at the ground state, then the uh, 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 CO1 state act as the uh, artificial atom. And now we have an artificial atom. We can uh, we can study atom-like interaction. In particular, in this work, we would like to study atom-like interaction in open space where there's no cavity. As I will show later, even without cavity confinement, we can still see uh, quantum coherence effects. So uh, this is the cartoon or about like, if we have a two, uh, we have an atom and shine, uh, shine light to the resonant light to the atom and the light will be uh, scattered by the atom. And so, so if we have uh, an atom in three-dimensional space, a resonance propagate from the left to the right, and then hit the atom, the atom absorb the field and emit the field to the four pi solar angle. And actually, the incoming field and the field emitted by the atom will uh, 
uh, the sum of them will uh, give rise to the extension of the forward dire direction. That's because of the destructive interference effect of the forward directed field between the incoming field and the field emitted by the uh, by the atom. And such kind of system using single molecule has been performed. That, however, due to uh, spatial move mismatch between incoming field and the field emitted by the atom, and therefore the uh, the in interference effect is not perfect, and they only observe only 12% uh, extension dip, transmission dip. And in our system, we can confine, where we can confine the atom in one dimensional space, one D waveguide transmission line, we can study the problem much more efficiently. So the, uh, the emitted field of the atom has to interfere uh, effectively with the incoming field, uh, result in uh, perfect uh, reflection and no transmission because of the uh, perfect uh, destructive interference. So this is our device. So our transmog qubit, superconducting artificial atom, embedded in the uh, uh, trans copanel waveguide. So this is the trans center transmission line, and this is grounded, this is grounded, and the black part are the uh, substrate, the silicon substrate. And we have, uh, if I show you, the, this part is the notification part of the screen group, where we have, we, we take a cross section here, is the Joseph Junction, aluminum, aluminum oxide, and aluminum. And note that the size of the atom is about 160 micrometer, which is quite big, but still, is mu uh, still much smaller than the wavelength, and therefore, we can uh, treat the atom as a point-like particle. And uh, in the trick that, as I told you that in this work, uh, oh, thank you, um, you can ask any question during the talk. Yes, uh, as I told you that in our work, uh, we don't have any confinement of the cavity. So even with adult cavity, we can see quantum coherent effect. So there's no cavity here. And, but uh, there's, uh, uh, as I will show you with, uh, later, we intentionally uh, strongly couple the qubit with the transmission line. So the relaxation rate is dominated by the transmission line. And such kind of uh, uh, qubit in open transmission line system has pioneered by SFA in 2010. And one year later, uh, we catch up and we, uh, we, uh, uh, we use a, a transmog system and make a use, useful device. So there's uh, some uh, theory about this uh, qubit in open transmission line system. So uh, we have a microwave propagate uh, and then interact with uh, the qubit as initialized at the ground state, interact with the qubit and then reflected or transmitted. So the reflection coefficient is defined as uh, uh, average of a uh, uh, reflected field divided as a very average of the uh, incoming field and the same definition as the transmission coefficient. And the reflection coefficient in one D open transmission line system can be written in the following way where big gamma is the relaxation rate and then small gamma is the, uh, is the defacing rate which is the combination of uh, relaxation rate and the pure defacing rate, and small uh, detuning. This is the detuning, and then this uh, big omega is the the drive uh, is the omega uh, omega uh, Robbie frequency of the drive. So this is proportional to the amplitude of the drive. Uh, so uh, with a very low power, so low amplitude and on resonance. So this is zero. This is zero and weak. So this is neglectable. So the reflected field on under this condition uh, is uh, can be written in the following way, where it depends on the ratio uh, between pure defacing rate and the relaxation rate. As I told you before, we can engineer the uh, relaxation rate intentionally coupled to the transmission line. So uh, so that we uh, we we design such that gamma one zero is much bigger than gamma pure defacing. Then, from this, according to this formula, uh, this will, uh, reflection coefficient uh, at weak power of resonance should be equal to one, which means that the 
that uh, the qubit after the mirror uh, perfectly reflects the electromagnetic field at the low power res of resonance. And this is the result, the first result. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, what we measure is the transmittance, which is defined as a transmission uh, uh, amplitude square as a function of uh, in incoming uh, resonance field, uh, resonance with uh, zero one transition. And then we measure two different samples, and you see uh, they have uh, similar behavior at the weak uh, pro power. So you know uh, the, the pro uh, power, which is proportional to average number of photons. If we have a low average number of photons, then almost full reflection at the low power uh, results in very uh, low transmission or no transmission. And then, if we increase uh, num on average number of photons more and more, uh, since the atom can only reflect one photon at a time, so most of the photon will just pass by, leading to uh, unity transmission. Uh, besides transmission, we can also measure reflection. Uh, this shows you we can we measure compare uh, coherence versus incoherence reflection or scattering. So for sample two, uh, this is, uh, y axis is the output power, x axis is the incoming uh, resonance power, and then uh, we use uh, two different average methods. This is the voltage average square, captures phase sensitive, which is a phase sensitive measurement, voltage square average, which is a phase insensitive measurement. For phase sensitive measurement, we capture elastic, uh, signal and for phase insensitive measurement, we capture total scatter signal and we use two different uh, ca uh, capture measurement bandwidth uh, 100 megahertz and 10 megahertz. You see, 100 megahertz, the green line is much bigger. That's because we capture uh, when we open more bandwidth and we capture more incoherent signal. And uh, the solar line are explained by the model triplet model. If we have a uh, uh, resonance field on resonance with C1 transition, increase the power, and then the level gets read. There's a three le three possible transition, uh, po three possible uh, emission possible emission channel, uh, which correspond to the errors here. So so-called model triplet, and you see from this plot. The more bandwidth that we open, uh, the more incoherent signal that we capture. So we we ask the next questions: uh, What's the uh, photon statistics of the reflected field? Um, so uh, back to our system, we have this uh, two level uh, two level atom, and then uh, we input a uh, a coherent state, and the coherent state can be written in the superposition of, uh, uh, in the basis of number states. And then if it's very weak, then we can approximate uh, 0, 1, 2, and the higher order can be neglected. And this is a Poisonian distribution. And if uh, if one photon is coming, uh, it will be reflected. But if there's two photons is coming, the pair of photons tend to transmit it because uh, the uh, two level atoms can only reflect one photon at a time. Therefore, the two photons tend to transmit it. That lead to that leads to uh, bunching statistic in the transmitted field and anti-bunching statistic in the uh, in the reflected field. This has been theoretical study in the following paper. And this is how we measure the second order uh, correlations of the microwaves. Uh, so uh, uh, you just follow me. So this is the field that. Uh, we input from the microwave source and then propagate, uh, uh, propagate like through the attenuator and then interact with the two level atom and then follow the path of the circulator. And then this is a microwave type of the beam splitter, split into two paths, and then we have a two amplifier chain to measure the power power correlation of two, power, uh, two amplifier chain. And if we measure reflected signal, we can input the signal from this side, and then reflected, and then power-power correlation. So this is this type of measurement is so-called hard ground trace measurement of output states, and uh, 
and the second order correlation function can be written in the following way, where delta P1, delta P2 is the, uh, the covariance, the power covariance of the path one and path two, and we, we, we need to subtract the P1N, which is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the noise of the amplifier. P1N is the uh, noise of amplifier one and noise of the amplifier two, P2N. Okay, so uh, so here, uh, so here, this is the result. Uh, we measure the uh, the G two of transmitted field, and we show the we see the superbunching statistics. So G two as a function of uh, so second order correlation function as a function of uh, uh, delay time tau, and you see uh, at delay time tau zero here, and at the weakest that we can measure. This is minus one, two line dBm corresponds to the power saturation regime, this regime, and we see, uh, we see uh, a, 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 a very huge uh, bu a bunching statistics. As we increase the power, the statistics, uh, the bunching statistics degree, de degrade, and you see the line cut here correspond to red uh, curve here, and uh, G2 at zero delay, the bunching statistics degrade as, a fun as we increase the uh, uh, resonance uh, incident power. And you see uh, at the very weak uh, uh, power, we see super bunching statistics, but uh, we, we have a very high incident resonance power. Uh, since we saturate the uh, two level atom, then uh, therefore uh, uh, it gets back to coherent state statistics. Uh, so for reflector field, we measure uh, G2 as function of delay time tau also, and this is the power region that we can measure, uh, the lowest power region that we can measure, and we see uh, we see the uh, dip, we, di we see an anti-bunching dip, and this, uh, this anti-bunching behavior uh, reveal quantum nature of lights. And, uh, and from theoretical prediction, you might you might predict uh, this tip should be at this tip should be zero. But due to the result, due to the effect of the measurement bandwidth, uh, measurement bandwidth and temperature and the uh, non ideality of the measurement, and therefore we can uh, only get down to about zero point five. So the other topic I want to address is. Uh, uh, what if we put an, uh, an atom in front of a mirror in this uh, one-dimensional open wave guy, semi-open wave guy? So um, we have uh, again we have this two-level atom, and we put it in front of a uh, boundary condition, a mirror. Uh, the this is a grounded, so acted as a uh, as a mirror boundary condition. We have reflect the electromagnetic field, and we inject the <coughs> Uh, the microwave zone here and see what's the reflection, uh, reflection coefficient. Again, we have the script loop like that, and we once we've put magnetic field into the script loop, we can change the uh, resonance frequency of the two-level artificial atom. And actually, such uh, kind of uh, system has been first investigated in uh, using single ions. Uh, however, in their system, uh, it's hard for the, uh, they, they perform in three dimensional space uh, where as we, we perform in one dimensional space uh, uh, for them it's very hard for them to uh, collect all the uh, effect uh, the scattered field from the atom effectively however in our case uh, we, we collect the collects uh, we collect uh, efficiently and um, and you see, uh, this is the um, uh, the symbol of the, our system. So this is grounded, and we have a distance between the mirror, the between the mirror and the two level atom with distance L, and uh, the the red and the red and blue field shows you the uh, resonance electromagnetic field uh, propagate uh, distribute along the transmission line where grounded is zero, and then depending on the atom state at the node or the anti-node, then there's a different coupling. If the atom state at the node, there's no coupling between the field and the atom. 
But if there's atoms stay at the antinode, there's a maximum coupling. Uh, so by changing the normalized distance, lambda, so normalized distance is L over lambda, so lambda is transition wavelength of the atom, which we get Q by, uh, by the magnetic field through the script loop, and by changing this uh, uh, normalized distance, and therefore we can change uh, either the atom stay at the node or the anti-node, anti -node, and we can see uh, uh, the, the, how the, the, the atom couple to the, to the vacuum field. So, that, uh, so the mirror, the row of the mirror here shapes the mode of the vacuum that couple to the, uh, to the atom. Um, so here, as I told you that, uh, we can change the uh, magnetic field or flux through the screen loop, then we can change lambda, and therefore change L over lambda, which uh, is the normalized distance between the mirror and the atom. And now we change the flux or the magnetic field through the, uh, through the, through the atom, and we change the uh, transition wavelength of the atom, and you see uh, the atomic response uh, happen to be here, and you see all the atomic response, but you, you, you recognize that some region it disappeared. And that's because, uh, as I told you before, when, when the length, when the length of the, uh, between the mirror and the atom is a lambda over two, where the atom stayed at the node, then there's no coupling between the atom and the mirror, so the atom uh, decoupled from vacuum fluctuation, and therefore there's uh, no atomic response. And if we take further line cut uh, on the red and blue here, so red corresponds to red theta here, and blue corresponds to line cut blue here, and you see uh, the line width here change a lot. And if we fit uh, the dip and the and the width here can be fitted by the theory, and we can extract the by we can extract the spontaneous emission rate and the pure defacing rate, and we see uh, the red and the blue change by uh, one order of, about one order of magnitude. And by further, take a line cut, all the line cut here, take the line cut all the here, and perform the same fitting, we extract the spontaneous emission rate as a function of a normalized distance, so spontaneous emission rate, the red marker, and the pure defacing rate, the blue marker, and uh, as a function of normalized distance, and we see uh, the, the spontaneous emission rate actually oscillates. And this oscillation is, uh, uh, ag agree with the foreign theory, the spontaneous emission rate oscillates as a function of cosine, theta, cosine square theta, where theta is the uh, phase difference between the between scattered field from the same atom. So uh, you have the atom here, and you have a mirror here. You have a field propagate, and then excite the atom, and the field uh, will emit from the, to the left or to the right, to the left, propagate toward the mirror, advancing back, and then further interference to the right. And this is, uh, and, and due to this interference effect, so we, uh, this, this field propagate, uh, towards to the mirror bouncing back, that's two factor of two, and it, it, it acquired the distance L over lambda, and pi phase shift from, from the mirror, and therefore it gives rise to the uh, oscillation of the spontaneous emission rate. And now we have the spontaneous emission rate as a function of normalized distance. The goal is to extract the uh, vacuum fluctuations near the qubit, and then uh, we need to have a uh, coupling constant. So we need to calibrate the system of the coupling constants. And therefore, we perform the following. Uh, we, we want to uh, calibrate the atom field coupling K. So we measure the reflection coefficient as function of incident resonance power. And, uh, and we see, so this is a real, real, real part response and imaging part response. You, you can think as uh, amplitude or and phase response and you see there's a, uh, this curve like that, 
And at this region, uh, it's relative high reflection. This reflection is due to reflected by the atom, the field reflected by the atom. And at this region, the atom is uh, 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 saturated, and the field is uh, reflected by the boundary condition. And at this region, the reflection coefficient is equal to one. That's because we measure, this is a phase sensitive measurement. This only captures the uh, uh, phase uh, coherent signal. So the field actually emitted, all the field emitted incoherently. And by fitting this curve here, we can extract the uh, coupling constant K. And uh, by following this formula, the spontaneous emission rate is related to the spectral density through the, uh, the coupling constant K, then we can plot the spectral density as a function of a normalized distance. And you see uh, uh, the, the black curve are the, are the theory without any fitting parameter, and then the red are the data that we showed you before, and uh, the, the blue region is the region where we can, cannot observe any, any data. This, the blue region, is the region here, the region here, that we cannot observe any data. And you see, uh, this part is the uh, small part of this here, uh, the magnification part of this guy is here, and you show the, uh, the spectral density actually oscillate between, from anti-node to the node, uh, between two quanta to zero quanta. And so in conclusion, I show you a couple of quantum optical phenomena, including resonance, scattering, and uh, photon number filter. And finally, we show you uh, we can modify the spontaneous emission rate and extract the uh, spectral density. And, uh, and this work is done at Chalmers uh, in Sweden. And uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, you mean a lot of uh, qubit states, right? Uh, yes, uh, copied by qubit uh, states. Yeah, um, <laughs> I think so. Like, I think some group like uh, use some crystal, like uh, real ion crystal, and there's a lot of sp uh, real uh, spins in the in the crystals, and then they excite one, and then. Uh, create some kind, but I'm not expert on that. Yeah. No, no, in your system is artificial atom. Oh, okay, uh, with uh, artificial uh, atom. Yeah, we can make a lot of artificial atom for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but it, it's uh, it's about uh, local control. Uh, like you you need to precise control of each artificial atom. You need to control the transition level of each mm -hmm. each. Uh, each at, each atom, and you need to have uh, each atom. You need to have a local uh, a flux line, a local magnetic field line, uh, and um, I think in general it's possible. It, it, but uh, still, it will be it still it will be hard. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, uh, may I uh, uh, add to this? They simply have to be identical in energy. Ah. Ah, and, they, and, uh, and they are not, oh. I guess. Yeah, they are not. Yeah. So that's why we need to have. If a they local, are not, then local, you, you local don't local have. Magnetic field. We, if we have a local magnetic field, we can tune the transition energy such that such that all of them are the same. We can tune it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have this been done before? No. Just no. tuning the transient frequency of your tubing. Yeah, we, we a lot of group has done like tuning, tuning. Yeah. This is this. Is, how about this uh, two qubit is very uh, close uh, with the tr uh, transient frequency very close to each other? Uh, it, you mean uh, two superconducting ring? Yeah. Uh, have, having the resonant frequency very close to each other. Have you have this been done before? I think a lot of group has has. Then it's possible to prepare some 
Well, uh, if they are close to each other, then uh, the take two, yes. Yeah, two. That's uh, then uh, uh, Dicky states, if you like to call them that, are the states in which they share one excitation, and then you have a huge dipole-dipole uh, splitting between the symmetric and the anti-symmetric uh, state. The symmetric state will be bright and the anti-symmetric state will be dark, decoupled from the field and therefore also hard to observe. But uh, this, uh, I think, should be doable if you just have control of the uh, energy splitting yeah. of the two. Individually, right? Individually. Yes, uh, we just need it on chip flux line, on chip local molecular field tuning. Uh, does uh, uh, the energy splitting between uh, different atoms uh, is uh, due to electric field or uh, due to some uh, fabrication of uh, quantum dots of uh, different size? Uh, you see, you see this here. We have a loop here. You, if you put magnetic field through the loop here. You can change the uh, level splitting, so you can tune such that all the qubits are the same transition energy. The fact that you do not couple to the dipole, <coughs> which means that you have no interaction between the current density or the effective di electric dipole and the electric field. Independently is is very clear. However, what is not clear to me is why you don't see anything which is higher than the dipole, quadrupole, and so on, which may couple to the magnetic field in the cavity, and you, in, in which case you will not have identically zero interaction. My question is why? How come you don't see that? Uh, is it pre-designed or it just so happens? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I haven't think about it, but it might be because this higher order in fact are so small that we haven't observed or observed that or uh, whether you would see absolute zero, as you indicate here, then I would say, well, it's all about no, I mean, yes, zero, no. I think it's about all about comparison. That's the energy scale, the comparison here is the, uh, the, the, the relaxation rate and the pure, the relaxation rate here and the pure defacing rate, pure defacing rate. If the, uh, um, you can think of like uh, if uh, uh, if the qubit is very bad, if the qubit is very bad, it no longer act as a uh, as a mirror. Uh, let me think. Let, let me think about it. Yeah. This uh, this region is like uh, when the gamma is approximately zero. This gamma. Yeah. I, I I think yeah. I, I have to think about it. I, I cannot answer your question. Yeah. I have to think about it. So uh, now uh, let's close the morning session, and there will be some lunch boxes outside. So you are free to have uh, lunch and talk to each other in this room or outside in the outside area. And our afternoon session start from two uh, p.m. Okay, thank you very much. I will give you the whole thing. Do you have a video? Yeah, there is another discussion about this. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know. We like to think that we have started this discussion.